one of the things uh, I noticed when I was writing the speech, the same day uh, President Biden uh, you know, gave that speech in Philadelphia, there was a tweet from CGTN, the Chinese state media, uh, and I quote, uh, it has been eight years since Gamergate exposed sexism and harassment of female gamers, and while some things in the community have gotten better, it appears the toxic environment that plagued the industry still hasn't been fully eradicated. Uh, the language is obviously uh, familiar to most of you. Um, you probably see that in every university, uh, you know, schools, media. The venue in this case was very interesting. Um, our comrades, they have figured out, you know, just which buttons to push, you know, uh, to foment the kind of discontent when there are, there are some of those things that's already happening in this country anyway. Like, you know, what, what they see, that this is a, a society where there is a, a specific governing ideology, um, which would, you know, uh, it, it, it would grant you special privileges. Like, you, you'd be out of, you know, if you commit a crime, uh, it's not going to be, a even if it's a felony, you're still going to be out of jail. And they know how to exploit those things. It's, uh, there is a stifling ideological hegemony over every layer of life, academia, media, state policies, uh, a government which is uh, paranoid about foreign influence, but it, they're failing to see how their own ideology essentially fuels the discontent uh, exploited by rival powers. Uh, so as Gustav Flaubert once wrote about the loss of uh, post-Napoleonic French hegemony, uh, that at the first sign of trouble, England will occupy Egypt, Russia will take Constantinople, and in retaliation, we'd get ourselves massacred in Syria. Um, one of the things we, you know, every hegemon needs to remember is um, at the end of the day, the biggest threat is, you know, when you're led by architects of your own destruction. Uh, so this is what the, you know, the crux of my speech today is going to be, uh, translating the history and theoretical framework to, uh, to the rhetoric of policy and strategy. Uh, the threat, we all know what's coming. I'm going to give you a brief, a uh, little bit of numbers there. Um, but how to deal with that, what should be a realist grand strategy? Everyone knows about the theory, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do a Michael Anton here, but you know, what, what to do after? Like, what, what does it translate to, to policy? Um, so I divide my talk into three parts. One, the threat of China is outlined. Uh, two, we'll see what realism dictates about strategic interests. And three, uh, we would briefly explore the challenges that we face within. So, China is the biggest challenge that the U.S. has faced in its entire history, and that's, that's, not, that's not, it's not like a, a, just a statement. Um, it's not the type of challenge we are used to, uh, and I'll give you some numbers. The GDP of China, when measured as the rival GDP of a great power compared to the U.S., is 77%. It's up from 13% in 2001 compared to other systemic rivals that the U.S. faced in history, including Imperial Germany, 35%. Nazi Germany, 26%, Imperial Japan, 13%, and Soviet Union, roughly around 40%. According to, the, uh, according to Statista, uh, in 2017, China had 4.7 million STEM graduates, uh, compared to India, 2.6 million. The US had 568,000. Um, when it comes to the military, uh, China is the was second largest spender, allocated around 300 billion to its military in 2021, which is an increase of 4.7% compared to 2020, and the spending that grew for the, for the last 27 consecutive years. Uh, Chinese carrier groups are all concentrated in Asia. American warships are placed in places like Bahrain and, and the Baltics, um, where the hegemonic threats uh, can be balanced by the local powers, as we see Russia is being stuck in Ukraine. It's not a major challenge that, you know, we have to deplete our resources there. It's, again, one of the points that I'm going to come back to. Um, China is stockpiling food. This is a very interesting thing that I found was research for my speech. Um, at the end of this year, China, with 20% 20, 20 of the world's population, will have 65% of the world's corn and 53% of the world's wheat. Uh, a study found 160 incidents of Chinese espionage in, in America, 24% of those between 2000 to 2009, 76% uh, of those incidents between 2010 to 2021. Um, I'll, I'll, I can give you some numbers again, like this is what, pretty much what I do, I bore people with numbers. 42% um, of the actors were Chinese military, 32% uh, were private Chinese citizens, 26% were non-Chinese actors, 
who were Americans, paid by China. 34% uh, of the incidents went, uh, were sought to acquire military technology, 51% uh, for commercial technologies, and 41% cyber espionage. And one of the final you know, statistics that I found, uh, you know, all of you know about the Chinese Confucius Institutes, uh, 104 of them. Uh, some of them are closed, but 28 of them have replaced them with a similar program, and 58% have maintained close ties with their funders back in China. Uh, but they are doing the exact opposite of what they are tweeting in American social media. And again, this is interesting. They have banned any kind of feminine men on TV recently, according to a Chinese uh, government directive. Uh, they have, <laughs> their, their education ministry uh, came out with a plan that they have to cultivate masculinity in boys um, with more effort on physical education. And they have, cracked, they have a crackdown, launched a crackdown on, on, on any kind of activism, uh, including Me Too, in China. So um, what they are tweeting here, they are doing the exact opposite when it comes to policy in their own country. Uh, meanwhile, TikTok released a press release a couple of weeks back, opening about a new election integrity center in the US that will influence uh, American misinformation. So... There you go. Um, I think Josh mentioned that as well. Um, so the Chinese challenge is a little more than just a seaborne invasion of Taiwan. That's, I think that's a, that's a strategic mistake that we think, like, you know, we, we, we focus on, on just the foreign policy aspect of it, but, but there's a lot bigger challenge, which is uh, internal. Uh, but before I delve into my final, you know, the, the policy part of it, um, what does realism in foreign policy dictate anyway? Well, number one, world is anarchic, uh, you know, there is, there is no, there no hierarchy, um, there is no global policeman that you can go to, great powers rise and fall, often due to conflicts, but also due to insecurity, ideological crusades, and, you know, survival in, in a great power rivalry is very important. Uh, one of the things that Matthew mentioned about the Cold War, the Cold War was a long game, you know, we, we, we have to keep in mind that it's not, it's not going to be over in, in 10 years' time, we can't just back away. If we do think that we are in a Cold War with China, we have to prepare accordingly. Two, alliances are a means to an end. Uh, you know, let's, Hans Morgenthau, obviously, one of the greatest American realists, uh, you know, who I studied when I was doing my own PhD. Um, you know, he mentioned that the, the rhetoric of lofty, you know, human rights promotion, which was used during the Second World War, it was a rhetoric. At the end of the day, the challenge was strategic. The, the fundamental idea of grand, American grand strategy was not to let two continents, either in Asia or in Europe, be dominated by a great power. You know, the, 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 the core motivation was not ideological, it was strategic. Uh, finally, one of the crucial points is buck passing is a very smart strategy, um, but not in the way that we understand uh, in, in, in realism, in, in foreign policy, in theory. Um, one of the smartest ways to fight an absolutely unavoidable great power war is to primarily rely on foot soldiers of allies and give them the support. So, you know, offshore balancing, it's a, it's a very smart way forward. Um, so what are the policy uh, prescription that comes from this, this, this realist ideals and history? Number one, arm Taiwan to the teeth. It's, it, it's one of the simplest things to do. Um, remember that Asia in 2022 isn't similar to Europe in 1949. Uh, you know, China is surrounded by Japan, Vietnam, Australia, and India, powers that are either treaty allies or in tactical alignment with the U.S. That's a strategic advantage that we have. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough to imagine a scenario where China is simultaneously uh, at war in the Himalayas or in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea. So having, having a sense of proportion is crucial. It gives us time to arm, you know, some of our allies that's in Asia. Uh, the Chinese, uh, talking about the seaborne invasions, um, the area denial strategy that we constantly hear about, uh, that China has an advantage, it's also an advantage against China. You know, we, we could use, we could arm Taiwan and give the same kind of weapons that could have been used against us. So again, that's a, that's a structural advantage. Uh, seaborne invasion is not an easy thing to do. I mean, Matthew is the army guy here, but you know, uh, Taiwan is, a, is, a, is an island of 24 million people. You know, if, if they're armed properly, they could, you know, it could turn into China's own 20 years of misadventure if they obviously uh, launch this, this war. Second point, uh, husband resources. You know, uh, one of the things that, you know, we learn from history is, you know, great power collapse just, is not just because of war. 
It's because of atrophy, it's because of internal decay, overstretch, there are lots of reasons for it. Um, one of the smart strategy is uh, to avoid insolvency. You know, so we, we you know, husbanding resources inside the country is far more important uh, compared to, to kind of like crusading idea of like we need to spend money on, on every domain. Uh, the strategy dictates that you need to prioritize on, on which regions or, or which uh, industries that you need to. And finally, uh, understand the ideological roots of, of our current grant strategy. You know, when, when, when people talk about liberal hegemony and liberal rules-based order, we, we need to understand, you know, what that means. Think of it this way. Um, the Soviet state universities, they were extremely diverse. You know, there were top students from China, Kazakhstan, Syria, and Poland, but they were all communists. You know, uh, so just because you have like great minds in, 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 in somewhere dictating policy doesn't mean that, you know, they will have a diversity of opinion. You know, some of the smartest minds can be deeply ideological. Um, so the bias that's in favor of uh, assumed mass rationality is kind of like always flawed. Um, so, and, and one of the, you know, uh, our grand strategy that's coming uh, is, you know, promoting this rights abroad without thinking of the strategic considerations uh, anywhere is essentially uh, a fundamental cause uh, between the current decay and internal decay that's happening in the US. So the root causes of, of, um, of our foreign policy are the same as our internal policy, and that's, that's coming from the same places. Uh, to sum up, uh, the realist option would be to prop up local actors, um, be in the front line of deterrence, build up strength and focus inward. Uh, the Cold War playbook is a, smart, uh, a lot smarter option than the post-Cold War playbook that we have seen in the last 30 years. Um, again, Cold War is a long game. It takes a lot of time. There is a lot of history behind it. The early Cold Wars are always you know, uh, more difficult uh, before you find an equilibrium, before you find, uh, understand the red lines of, of the foreign rivals, know there uh, the places that you can exploit. Uh, it's gonna take time. It's, it's not gonna be over tomorrow. Um, it, the challenge of China is uh, it's far more complex than, than the Churchillian binary that we con continue to hear everyone, everywhere. You know, it, it's uh, uh, America's internal problems uh, and this, and this post-Cold War crusading impulse kind of adds on to the problem that we face uh, whenever we face a grand strategic rival in the, in the foreign stage. Um, I, uh, it's customary when you're a foreigner to, you know, uh, to mention Washington's farewell address if you're a, if you're a realist. So, I, and, and so one of the things which everyone talks about from that is avoiding foreign entanglements abroad. The thing that they don't mention is there is a second part to that statement. Um, avoiding foreign influence at home is also equally important. Uh, you know, Washington said, and we forgot, that the, one of the great rules of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations, our detached and distant situation invites and enables us to pursue a different course. Uh, because foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican uh, government. Um, I'd end with uh, another of my favorite George. Uh, this is George Canning, whose guiding principle for British foreign policy uh, during the imperial times was non-intervention, no European police system, balance of power, respect of facts, uh, respect for treaty rights, but caution in extending them. Do not overstretch and understand that there is always, always influence from abroad. So I think before ending, we should relearn the, the old wisdom of the two Georges uh, as we face uh, an old type of rivalry returning to form. And uh, I look forward to the comments later on. Thank you. Thank you.